Hi everybody and welcome back to the site. I'm going to do this thing all over again. So I was about five minutes into this video and I realized I had the microphone facing the wrong direction. And of course none of you will be able to hear me. So we're going to do a take two on this. If you haven't checked out the previous video, the one just before this one, uh, I suggest you do so because this is kind of a follow-up to that and where we actually designed and built an electronic circuit breaker. And the inspiration for this project came from the original design by another YouTuber by the name of Glasslinger, G-L-A-S-S-L-I-N-G-E-R. And Ron over at the Glasslinger YouTube channel uh, does a lot of really interesting videos. If you're into electronics, especially vintage electronics like vacuum tubes and things like that, super interesting site. I highly recommend you go check it out. And also check out his original design. He's the one that came up with this idea and I'm giving him full credit for it. I just took that idea and kind of started thinking <laughs> and came up with my own little spin on it. So that's what we're doing here. But this video is not going to see the final, final product that I built, but rather it's going to try to address two of the questions and comments that I've been repetitively receiving since the, I posted that video. I really got a lot of really good suggestions, good comments, good questions on this electronic circuit breaker. It was really exciting to see people thinking and coming up with different and new ideas and different ways of implementing this type of a device and this type of circuit, some of the mods you can make. So what I want to do just in this video is show you two different things that uh, kind of have been a lot of comments of it have been about. Number one, we're going to talk about the current sense module itself and the difference between a current sense transformer and a Hall effect sense current sense module. Okay, if that makes sense, a Hall effect current sense module. So we're going to look at those first. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to address one of the questions we had or several comments we had on the triax, um, how they work. And we're going to just take a quick look at a couple different methods of switching AC voltage um, without using just a mechanical relay. So if those two things sound interesting to you, stay tuned. That's what this video is about. And thank you all again for all the participation in the comments. This is how we learn. This is how we help one another. And this is how we come up with new ideas is by interacting in the comments section of the videos. So thank you all again. I really appreciate it. The first thing I want to talk about is at the end of the circuit, the device that we're using to break the circuit and make the circuit when there's an overload. So what I mean by that is the actual element of the circuit that will disconnect power from the load when there's an overcurrent. And a lot of comments I've received both on uh, the use of a relay, a mechanical relay, and the use of the triac the way I did it. So uh, Ron in the first, in his original design, used an actual relay like this, a mechanical relay and I used a device called a triac. And there's advantages and disadvantages to using both of them, but I think some of the uh, comments, I want to kind of clear the water how, you know, how these things work. So first let's start with the mechanical relay here. So all a mechanical relay is, is a little electromagnet, and when you apply voltage to the coil down here. It's going to pull this little tab down and it's going to pull these little contacts in right here. See if it'll focus on it. There it goes. So you see that? Those little contacts in there? And now the way Ron did it was he was using what's called the normally closed contact. So when this thing is flipped up, when the little flipper is up like this, you can see that the contact, which connects to this wire here, is touching this top pin or this top contact. It's closed right now. And if I applied current here, it would flow through this wire, through this little tab, through the contact, and out this tab up here. Now, if I was to 
energize the coil down here and this thing pulls in then it's going to disconnect this little tab from this top contact and it's going to connect it to this bottom one it's going to pull down you can just kind of barely see that in the vid in the uh, camera here so one of the things that everybody was commenting was since it's using the normally closed contacts if the circuit itself the control circuitry was to fail this thing would fail in the closed position so even though it's failed it's going to allow current to flow to the load that's connected to it which could possibly cause the load to be damaged on the other hand the way these things react there's a little spring here you see this spring see it in there and that spring is what's responsible when I remove voltage from the coil the magnetic field will go away and this little tat flipper will release and that spring will pull it up and there is a time delay from when this thing demagnetizes and lets go and then the spring actually pulls the contacts off so dropping out a relay is not very fast the other thing is if there's excessive current and these little these little terminals here actually draw a hard enough arc it can actually cause them to weld shut and the spring is definitely not going to be strong enough to overcome the force of those little contacts being welded on the other hand if you have an arc and you weld the contacts unless they weld really hard which doesn't always happen a lot of times the coil will be enough to pull it loose anyway so that's kind of a little bit of an advantage and pulling this down when this thing magnetizes it's a little bit faster you can get a faster reaction time to break the circuit but again all of that is kind of drawing at straws if you have the correct type of of relay um, it's really shouldn't be an issue because that's the difference between a relay and a contactor this is a relay and the contacts are very small and they're not really designed for high surge current but there are bigger relays that we call contactors and they have very large heavy contacts that are designed to extinguish those big arcs and like that things like that and they actually do a very good job of breaking a circuit under load so you can choose the correct component and this would be a very good option for that circuit so I just kinda wanted to explain that a little bit now getting to the triac thing one of the advantages of a triac is it's tiny you see how small this is but one of the comments that I kept getting over and over again is that triacs will never withstand a high surge current or they short out and fail easily they fail all the time and to a degree I agree with that and the issue though I see is in many instances the triacs are not being designed in the circuit or implemented properly yes they can fail and yes they can short but typically if you design within the parameters of the device you will find that these can be very reliable and last a very long time they're not quite as weak as you might think so let's take a look at the data sheet so here's the data sheet for this particular triac this little one here and this is not a really big one but it's also not a really small one it's kind of a medium sized and it's rated for an R RMS on state current with full sine wave of about 40 amps now does that mean you can put your AC mains into this at 240 volts or 120 volts and draw 40 amps through this tiny little device absolutely not what that means is the maximum current that is safe to use at absolute maximum would be 40 amps but you're still limited by the amount of heat dissipation that this little device can dissipate uh, it does this one in particular is good for 800 volts but not at 40 amps so if you tried to 
attach an 800 volt supply to this and draw 40 amps of current at that voltage level, this thing is going to be a crispy critter. It will probably vaporize. But at lower voltages, it can handle higher currents. And conversely, at higher voltages, when you're using lower currents, it will work just fine as well. The idea is to keep the device cool. You see, everything has a relative temperature with it that they're talking about. And that's really the key to this, is not letting it overheat. Um, as far as surge current, everybody says, well, if you have a short, it can go way higher than the 10 amps that you're setting the trip point at. What's going to happen it, you know, within a cycle? Well, if you look here, they actually rate these for that. For one full cycle, you could take a surge current of up to 400 amps, and, and that's at 50 hertz. And if you have 60 hertz mains, like here in the United States, for 16.7 milliseconds, you can actually have a surge current of 420 amps. So what that means is that you can have a pretty substan substantial short as long as you do not exceed one full cycle, which is why I kind of redesigned that circuit to be able to trip at one cycle instead of four or two cycles, which would be looking at the top half cycle of two cycles. Does that make sense? <laughs> Which was the original design. So I actually, the design I have will trip within that one cycle and therefore you're probably, because of the size of your incoming line, your power cord, the wires in there, the circuitry itself, I highly doubt that you will exceed 400 amps for that one cycle. Now looking even more into it, if we look at a surge peak on state current versus number of cycles, it shows you as you go more and more, you know, more cycles. So at 400, they're showing the line up here and they're showing at one cycle, you can have that 400 amps, but even out to 10 cycles, you're still pretty high up there in the amperage. Do you see where we're at? So it's really when the thing's on for a period of time and allowed to heat up that you start having problems. And when you look at an instantaneous peak, and we're talking a tenth of a millisecond or less than one millisecond, you can see the amperage gets exponentially higher. So the idea is <laughs> shut this bad boy down before it's on for very long and you probably won't have that problem. Now there are always instances where things can fail no matter what. That's one thing you learn in electronics no matter how bulletproof you try to make it there will we'll find a way to <laughs> damage it. Now this also is just sitting out in open air like this is going to be limited as to how long it can conduct current because it's going to heat up. Again, everything's temperature dependent on these things. So you would want this to be mounted to a nice healthy heat sink. And that's also going to allow it to last a lot longer and handle a lot more punishment. Now I'll show you kind of what I'm using here in my circuit. So what I'm using is a larger triac. You can see it's a flange mount and I have a heat sink off of a microprocessor that I've modified and it's got a heat pipe in it and it really carries away the heat very quickly. Um, I actually tested it and it's pretty amazing. I can put my heat gun on here full blast and until it gets so hot you know and as soon as I take the gun away this, you, this is touchable. It won't burn your finger and you can feel the heat radiating from this. So this can dissipate heat very quickly and this is a little bit bigger device. Now probably the silicon that's inside there isn't much bigger as you can see than what's in this device. The difference is the way they coupled it thermally to the case so that it can dissipate heat faster and that allows it to have a higher rating. And if we look at the data sheet here 
instead of 40 amps, this is only a 35 amp device. And it's only rated at 600 volts instead of 800 volts. So actually, technically, from the specs, this is a little bit lower rating. However, its ability to wick the heat away is much higher and it can handle a lot more thermal stress. So when you have this under a constant stress, um, even though this one has a little bit smaller surge current and so forth and maximum current, its continuous duty is going to be much better, which is why I'm using it. So uh, that just gives you a little idea of triax and how they work. Now, there are other methods. Um, there were people asking about different methods. I'm going to show you what we use in really high current, really high voltage uh, electronic circuits. And I'll show you that real quick. So the little diagram I've drawn here is what I refer to, or what we refer to at least in my line of work, as a commutating circuit. And, and specifically, this one's called a forced commutating circuit. So let's, let's just break this down component by component. If you take away this stuff in the middle here for a second and just look at the outside, this is a bridge rectifier, correct? However, I've kind of drawn it a little bit different, didn't I? So normally this would be your positive and your negative output and then up here and here would be your AC input. Well if you notice we're not connecting the positive and negative to anything. We're just using this bridge rectifier to pass AC current. Now without this in here, let's just take this out for a minute. So looking up here we have our AC power source. This would be your mains or whatever coming in. And I've kind of drawn an one AC cycle and if you notice the yellow is when the cycle is positively polarized and then the orange is when we're in the negative half cycle. So this would be the positive half cycle, the negative half cycle. So the polarities of the, these two wires are going to be switched. So for the positive half cycle, this is going to be the plus over here and this is going to be the minus. And then for the negative half cycle, this side's going to be the plus and this side's going to be the minus. Okay? So let's, let's walk through this. On the positive half cycle, we have the output here and the input here, and, you're, and I'm going to use conventional uh, flow instead of electron flow uh, convention, just so you know. If most of you should know what I'm talking about there. So we have the positive here, and you can see it can't go backwards through this diode because it's, it's biased the wrong way, right? It's facing the wrong way. But it can pass through this diode, right? So as it passes through here, it comes down here and this diode is backwards. So it can't get through here. So there's no path for positive voltage to flow from here down to here. It can't go this way and it can't go this way. In the negative half cycle, the positive is down here and the same thing happens. We want we can actually get through this diode. We can't get through this side because it's biased the wrong way. It gets through here, but as soon as it comes up here, can't get through this side. So right now, as it stands, there is no possible way that we can have current flowing through this circuit. But what happens if we add another diode down here in the middle. Now in the positive half cycle the current will flow through this diode. It can't get through here but it can flow through this one. It can come down here, flow through this one and come out. It's just like playing a maze game isn't it? It's like going through a maze. And in reverse polarity when we're on the negative half cycle the current can flow up through here, it can get through this diode, can't get through here, but it can get through this one again, 
and come back up and out. So you can see by adding this one diode in here, current can flow both ways. Now, this is an SCR, and you can see there's a little circuit here called make. This makes the circuit work, right? It's the make circuit. And so if I put an SCR in here and I don't put anything on the gate to trigger it, the SCR will be turned off. So for all intents and purposes, there's nothing here and no current flows in either direction. However, when I gate this, when I, when I apply a voltage to the gate, then this is going to turn on and it's going to allow current to flow. Now, the way an SCR works, for those of you who don't know, as soon as you gate an SCR, it will stay on until you take the flow of current away from this diode here. So you only need this to be a pulse to get it started. Once it gets jump started, you can turn this little signal off and it'll just keep conducting until you go through a zero crossing here. When the voltage drops below the voltage drop of this diode, then this thing will shut itself back off. So we can pulse this on at each uh, zero crossing and it'll turn on and allow the thing to conduct till it goes through a zero crossing again. The problem you're going to run into <laughs> is if this becomes DC, you, there's no way to turn this off. So as it sits right now with AC voltage, it ripples up and down and all we got to do is get a starting pulse, just turn this on for a split second and this will work this will work and then as soon as you take the voltage away um, I'm sorry I'm explaining it wrong with AC you have to turn this on and leave it on because every single time this goes through a zero crossing it'll shut itself back off so to turn it off just take the voltage away from here it'll go through a zero crossing and this will shut off it'll that's called self extinction okay it 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 will extinguish itself. That's self-extinction. But what happens if we want this to turn off in the middle of a cycle? I can take the voltage away from this, but again, it will continue to stay on until this voltage goes back through its zero crossing. And so I can't turn this off any faster than a half a cycle. So how do I shut it off? Well, <laughs> we're going to take another SCR and if you notice it's facing backwards and we are going to charge up a capacitor through this little charging circuit and once this cap is charged we're going to take this out of the circuit and we're going to turn the thing on with this one and when it's time to shut off we're going to shut this off, turn this on this is going to dump the capacitor backwards across here and it's going to extinguish the signal. Now it's not going to cause any problem up here. All it's going to do is it's going to extinguish this. This cap will discharge very quickly and it'll shut this down. We call this a forced extinction circuit because we're forcing this to extinguish itself before it just naturally turns off. This is how we get very high speed switching of AC in the really old x-ray machines that we used to have. We would do this type of circuit. This was called a forced extinction circuit. And this is how we were able to get exposures down to one millisecond. So, and, you know, that we could get very quick turn on and turn off. And that's what this was for. So that just gives you an idea. So really, if we wanted to get crazy with this circuit, <laughs> we could build this little circuit with four diodes and two SCRs, and we would need the appropriate circuitry to make and break, but we could actually turn this thing off anytime we want in the middle of a cycle as fast as we want. The other thing is some of these SCRs are huge. You can get SCRs that are, they, we call them hockey pucks, because some of them are that big around. And they can handle, you know, thousands of amps of surge current and hundreds of amps of continuous current with no problem. 
So that's really overkill for what we're doing to check little AM tube radios on our bench. But I thought it would be interesting to share that with you guys to see there are more than, than these two ways uh, of switching AC voltage. And that's one of the more common ones. Now, of course, with high frequency, all this goes out the window. We don't need this stuff. But in the AC mains frequency domain, this is a good little circuit. So anyway, I thought hopefully that was interesting to you. And uh, let's move on to the next half here. Last but not least, I just want to explain these a little more in a little more detail because we had a bunch of questions regarding them. One of the things was, are you, you know, if you have this, th this is what Ron used on his original device. And this is a current sense transformer. So you would take your piece of wire from the mains, you would pass it through this little center of the, of the hole here, the donut hole, and as current passed in both directions through here, it would induce a voltage out of here, and that voltage would represent the current flowing through there. And that's all it, this is. It's literally, it's a, a passive device, and it's just a transformer. And one of the questions was, well, you're using that transformer, you have to, you would have to rectify this signal in order for that device to be able to, you know, your LM358 comparator circuit to be able to read it. Well, that would not work. And the reason that would not work is the voltage that these things output is relatively small. So at very low currents, a lot of times the voltage coming out of here is less than one volt or right around one volt. And if you remember, each diode in a bridge rectifier is going to have, unless you're using a shot key, and even a shot key has some voltage drop, is going to have a voltage drop of somewhere around 0.6 to 0.7 volts. And then if you put two of them together, which in a bridge rectifier, you're always going to have two voltage drops, you can be almost a volt and a half. Or even with shot key diodes, you're still looking at over half of a volt of drop, which is going to seriously attenuate that signal and mess around with its, you know, with it. So you really couldn't do something like that with this. But this is an AC device. It does output an AC signal. And in order for this to work on both half cycles, you would have to change the circuit to be a, uh, a window comparator, kind of like what I did. Although you would have to change the center voltage and everything. It would be a little bit different for this compared to this. Now what this is, this is called a Hall Effect Current Sense device. And from here to here is just a straight conductor through there. And inside here is an active circuit. In other words, there's circuitry, there's electronic circuitry, there's a little preamp in here. And when you apply 5 volts DC to the circuit with respect to ground, it will output an offset voltage of 2.5 volts. So just powering this up, how it sits right here, you would have 2.5 volts or half of this, of your supply voltage coming out of here. If current is flowing in this direction, it will make the voltage go above 2.5 volts and it'll saturate just below the 5 volt rail. If you put voltage or pass current in this direction, polarity wise, it will make the voltage go down below 2.5 volts, down to its saturation voltage, which is just a little bit over zero volts. And it is scaled. It is very accurately scaled. So basically this thing can go up uh, six tenths of a volt roughly and it can go down about six tenths of a volt. So there's a swing in either direction that it can go. And in this particular device, this one is, uh, what is it? It's a 15 amp. I think the spec sheet for this says that for each amp of current that's flowing through here, it will, it will apply about a 42 millivolt signal. 
So in other words, you'll get about 42 millivolts added to or subtracted from the 2.5 volts for each amp. So it's a scaled thing. So basically think of this as like your push-pull amplifier where you're biased at 2.5 volts and you're going above and below that 2.5 volts as your current flows in the two directions. That's how this thing works. It's an active circuit. It's not an AC circuit. Even though that is, it is a varying voltage, it never goes negative. It's always positive because it starts out at 2.5 volts. It never goes below zero volts. It never goes above five volts. And therefore, it is a what we would call a pulsed DC voltage, not AC. AC means alternating. That means that the positive and negative would switch polarities. This does not do that. That is why with this with the circuit that we're using on that electronic circuit breaker, that is why we can actually see both halves of the cycle of that alternating current. Does that make sense? I know it can be confusing, but let's just do a little visual uh, experiment and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So here's one of those modules and you can see this is this one's a 15 amp version and what we're going to look at is right here V out the pin on this and I'll show you the, the setup here so I have a chip clip right on the LM358 and it's just going right into that pin 4 where is what, what's the input of that chip and uh, or is it pin, pin 5 I'm sorry pin 5 and it's just directly coming from the output of the module right here so you see the track going around and going right into there so that's what uh, that's what we have now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a split camera thing where we're going to do we're gonna look at the scope and uh, a little bit later here we're going to look at a second camera that I'm gonna show you the actual load that's being applied to that module so first of all if you notice I'm only on 20 millivolts per division so that's why there's all this noise because we're actually using a 10 times probe so and even with the bandwidth limiting like this I'm picking up a lot of background noise that is not what's on the module that's noise being picked up by um, the probe and all that stuff this is a high impedance input and yes you could change it to a 50 ohm input I, it doesn't work well <laughs> you don't want to mess with that because it will affect the signal so anyway if I turn this to DC so let's go over to coupling we change this to DC coupling you can see our waveform disappears and the reason it disappears let's take a look here is because it's it was off scale so this is what I was talking about with no current flowing through the device and the machine just energized so I just have you know my 12 volts and 5 volts on the circuit board you can see there's one two and a half volts there and that's called your DC offset voltage so there's an offset of 2.5 volts coming out of this module whenever there is no current flowing through the module now of course the actual signal that carries or that rides on that 2.5 volts is very very tiny so if we left this on DC and got this to where you could see it on here you would find out that the signal is so tiny you really wouldn't see anything on there so let me just demonstrate that right now you might see a tiny little bit of ripple on here but if we put some current through here and I'll show you in a minute what I'm doing you see how it's kind of you're starting to see some noise on there but you really can't see it barely anything and so you can't really see it on the oscilloscope like this so let me turn it back down see how it just goes flat so let's switch back over 
to AC coupling. That means we're going to reject that DC component and we're only going to look at changes from that DC point. So now that we're set at AC coupling, we can turn our sensitivity way up by dropping this down to 20 millivolts per division and you can see all the n noise and everything we're getting. But now let's watch what happens. And you can see there's actually a little waveform going on there. Now again, that waveform, it jitters and everything just because an oscilloscope really is doesn't work very well in the millivolt range like that. You're really stretching <laughs> the capabilities of an oscilloscope by doing that. And an analog scope might give you a little cleaner looking picture, but still you're going to see um, some noise like that. So disregard this. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go split camera and we're actually going to look at what that waveform does as you increase the current. Hopefully both cameras are working now. <laughs> so I have the one camera set to the power monitor. The other one is set to the oscilloscope. And we're looking at the output of that little current sense module. So right now we don't have any current flowing and you can see that. And I have a 8 ohm dummy load that I'm going to be feeding all this power into which is going to be kind of like where our current, which, where our current is going to be uh, superimposed onto. And we're, we're going to see what that little signal looks like now when we increase the current on the load. So here we go. I'm now turning up the variac. And you can see with about 700 milliamps you're getting just a faint little signal and as we increase the current until it trips the breaker which I'm gonna drive it all the way up I have it set at around 2 amps to trip the breaker at around 2 amps so let's see what it looks like there it goes and you can see it just tripped the breaker and that's what it does that's how it works so that's pretty much the signal that you're looking at and you can see how tiny it is and you can see with AC there's no problem but with DC it was kinda of hard for us to read now this circuit would need to be modified if we were going to use DC on it. The reason being is the little that little CD4040, that counter circuit, it counts pulses and each time we go above or below our set trip point of that voltage, you know, when that signal would swing up above where uh, where our trip point is, it it will initiate a pulse and that chip will count that as a pulse. You actually have to count two pulses before it will trip. Now in order to make this thing work as a DC limiter we would have to eliminate that 4040 counter and just have it directly output as soon as you exceed the current it trips the circuit. And That would be through we would just drive directly into that little SCR. Uh, or MOSFET, I'm sorry, that little MOSFET that's driving the triac circuit. For this next test, we're going to put DC on there. And I actually am not going to do any math or any kind of special tricks with the scope's display. I actually have it sitting right now at 2.5 volts. And I want you to kind of understand that. So this is sitting at 2.5 volts on this line right now. And what we're going to do is we're now going to apply a current of about 1.5 amps and just take a look at what happens to that DC level when we do that you have to watch closely and here we go see how it goes down and there you go 
Now, here's the other thing. <laughs> I put I put that I touched the wire two times and if you notice now it doesn't work and I have to hit this reset button here again. Where are we at? You can see the reset button in order to reset it and that's the counter there it's actually counting how many pulses I actually have the trip point set and that's the bad part of this if you notice I had to touch that wire two times to get the triac to trip off and the reason being for that is because DC voltage will not work with that 4040 counter circuit Remember, you need AC because it needs to go through that zero crossing in order to see. So the circuit, as it sits, is not designed, even though this thing can measure DC, it's not designed for it. Now, the other thing I want to do before we end here is we're going to reset it. And I'll show you, again, that's negative, right? If I just take the two wires, the plus and the minus and I switch them around so now I have current going the other way see how it goes up see that and that's how this little module works so it outputs a voltage both with the direction and the the amplitude of the current if that makes sense so when I had the positive and negative one way, it made the waveform go down. And when I had the, the positive and negative the opposite way, it made the voltage go up from 2.5 volts. I hope that clears that up because there was a lot of confusion with how these things work. It is not a uh, transformer. It's actually a Hall effect sensor. Somebody made a comment. Why do you have this great big giant S or MOSFET just to drive the input of this opto isolator chip and the reason being is the original design had one of these because it was actually driving the coil of a relay and some of those relay coils can get pretty big on the bigger contactors so you needed the added current I just left that in there if I ever wanted to drive something more than just an opto isolator it's in circuit to do it it doesn't hurt it to be there yes you could use a smaller MOSFET but it works fine and these really cost pennies they don't cost that much um, so anyway there you go and hopefully that clears up some of the questions and some of the comments well hopefully that answers a couple of questions for you guys and uh, thanks a lot this video obviously went longer than I wanted it to it always does but you know what if I don't take the time to answer the questions, I'll just have to answer them in the comments. So I try to minimize that so that I can get to everyone uh, as best I can. So anyway, I hope, uh, hope you enjoyed this little video. Pretty soon you'll be seeing the finished product, at which point, once I do that, um, I'll try to share a final schematic and uh, circuit board layout along, as lo along with the actual build of the device itself. So uh, again, there are many, many different ways to do what we're doing. And that's what I like about this electronic circuit breaker project because there is no right or wrong design. There are many different ways to approach this and get the same results. So it's a really cool thing for electronics, for, for learning and experimenting. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and we'll be back very soon. I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives, and I'll be seeing all of you very soon in the next video. Take care now. Bye-bye.